Okay, everyone, and welcome to this video, which goes through the Elizabethans exam. Okay, we're going to start by looking at question 6a and question 6b. So for question 6, you need to read a historical interpretation. There's two questions to answer, part A and part B. A is worth three marks, B is worth five marks. Let's read the two questions together. 6a, in interpretation A, the historian argues that most people in Elizabethan England did not share the views of the Puritans about dancing. Identify and explain one way in which he does this. 6b, if you are asked to do further research on one aspect of interpretation A, what would you choose to investigate? And explain how this would help us to analyse and understand popular culture in Elizabethan England. So let's have a look at question 6a. Um, so the first thing that you need to do is read the question carefully. So it says the author A. N. Wilson depicts the Elizabethan period as an important age of exploration. Identify and explain one way in which he does this. So what you need to do as you're reading the interpretation is you need to sort of highlight any part of the text where he um, kind of um, portrays, depicts the Elizabethan period as this, quote, important age of exploration. So that's the key thing that you really want to highlight within your and within your within the question on your paper. So we'll just have a look at this. So the extract is from a 2011 book called the Elizabethans by A.N. Wilson. So we'll just read the interpretation. The Elizabethan age was a time of exceptional wealth creation and expansion, which make this period of English history more colourful and remarkable than any other. This was the age when modern Britain was born and established independence from mainland Europe. British explorers went out to every corner of the known world. This was the age which saw the origins of English sea power. After Sir Walter Raleigh established the colony of Virginia, English was destined to become the language of the great globe itself, and the foundations were laid not only of later British imperial power, but also of American domination of the world. And imperial power means the power that comes from controlling an empire. So there's quite a lot of things that you can look at here to think about how um, A. N. Wilson depicts Elizabethan period as an important age of exploration. Uh, quotes like exceptional wealth creation and expansion, colourful and remarkable, modern Britain was born, every corner of the known world, origins of English sea power, uh, English was destined to become the language of the great globe itself. Foundations were laid not only of later British imperial power as well. Um, so that's, that's absolutely crucial. So there's some of the things that we could look at. So what you have to do is you have to identify and then explain. Now, the best way to think about this is that you are going to get one mark for identifying how the author puts across um, the, the view in the question. So this could be, for example, a technique that they use, um, or it could be a particular phrase that they use. Um, if it's an artistic interpretation, it could be something within the artistic interpretation, like how some someone has been portrayed. Um, so it might be like a film poster, for example. So in this example here, we could say the the author uses dramatic language when discussing the exploration of the Elizabethans. So that would be identifying how the author puts across the view. And it's not actually that dissimilar to the skills that you would use in your GCSE English language work, where you're analysing um, how people um, put across a point of view using various language devices and language techniques, for example, you know, things like repetition, rhetorical questions, the rule of three. Then what you're going to do, once you've identified it, you've got one mark, you are then going to explain and elaborate. And really what you're looking for here is a couple of sentences and uh, a couple of points to make. So here would be uh, what could pick you up another couple of marks. For example, he talks about it being an exceptional and more colourful and remarkable than any other period in history. This makes it seem like there were groundbreaking achievements and changes reinforcing it was an important age of exploration. So that would get you to three marks. Now, lots of you found question 6b quite difficult, so let's just have a look at this one in a bit of detail. If you were asked to do further research on one aspect of interpretation A, what would you choose to investigate? Explain how this would help us to analyse and understand England's connections with the wider world between 1580 and 1603. So a checklist for this question, you need to begin your answer, and many of you forgot to do this, explaining what impression you get from interpretation A. So really, you want to start off your answer by saying, well, actually, the impression I get from interpretation A is that this was an important um, age of exploration. Um, or, you know, it says things like, for example, um, this British explorers went to every corner of the known world. So you might want to investigate, you know, an element of that. 
The second part is explain what you're going to inquire into and what an inquiry question would be. So you're going to identify your area for further research and then you're going to pick out a, a specific inquiry question which must be linked to a second order concept. So it can't just be a descriptive um, question to so avoid any type of what question. So it can't be what places did um, the Elizabethans discover? It needs to be a you know, um, a sort of cause consequence question or similarity and difference question or a significance question um, or a change in continuity question. And then explain how it helped historians to find out more and then crucially about England's connections with the wider world. It's got to link to England's connections with the wider world. So an example answer here would be this one. Interpretation A gives us the impression that Elizabethan exploration had a positive impact on England, stating it led to exceptional wealth creation and leading to power and independence. So you've done the first bit. I would investigate how far these positive consequences affected all people in Elizabethan society. I would choose the inquiry question, did the wealth created by Elizabethan exploration benefit everyone in society? So that's you've done your question there. Um, and that's linked, obviously, to similarity and difference. Then you're going to do the last part of the question. How would it help us to analyse and understand? This would help a historian to understand more about the consequences of England's connections with the wider world and whether it only benefited a handful of rich traders such as Francis Drake. A couple of misconceptions here that we uncovered. Do not use your own knowledge for this question. You don't have to answer that question. OK, it's basically getting you to think, OK, if you read this interpretation, what would your next area of research be? Because that's essentially what historians do when they're finding out things. So it's you developing your own inquiry. OK, so that's how you do question 6B. OK, so we now go on to question number seven and how to answer that question. So for question seven, you need to read two historical interpretations and you need to explain the following, how far they differ and what might explain the differences, i.e. why they're different. So the question says interpretations B and C both focus on the power of Elizabeth. How far do they differ or what might explain any differences? So one of the things that you want to do when you um, begin reading these interpretations is as you're reading it, highlight some key quotes that really help you to understand what they say about the power of Elizabeth. So the interpretation B is an extract from an article entitled The Indomitable, and they actually tell you what indomitable means. It means someone who's difficult to defeat or conquer. Indomitable Female Fortress, Queen Elizabeth I, is published in 2013 on the Women's Media Centre website. The Women's Media Centre is an American organisation which aims to promote women's stories and roles. So what I've done here is I've highlighted some key quotes, and this is kind of like what your um, interpretation should look like in the exam when you've read it. So then you can come back to these quotes and use these to put across your point of view. So the other thing to be thinking about as you're reading it is what is the overall impression that you get of the interpretation? You can see that I've just written in purple what the overall impression is that Elizabeth was successful and inspiring despite the challenges of the time. Elizabeth I has always inspired me and reinforced the idea that women can do anything despite opposition. She was a successful monarch who, against all odds, led her country to a golden age while battling against the acute disadvantage of being a woman. In a time when gender equality was widely accepted, Elizabeth I was a strong monarch who was able to control her subjects. She was determined to remain free from any man who would inevitably seize hold of her power over England. While other European female monarchs often had little political power, Elizabeth took centre stage by carrying out all the duties of a ruler while neglecting the feminine duties of marrying and producing heirs. She did this to protect her power. So there you've got that this interpretation very much focuses on the successes of Elizabeth I. Now then, looking at interpretation C, because of the nature of this question, they're always going to give you two quite different interpretations, but there may well be some similarities between them. Uh, and certainly in interpretation C, we can see there is a recognition that some other people regard Elizabeth as being positive. So we're going to think about the um, main ideas here. The overall impression we get from this interpretation that Elizabeth was not a successful monarch and she didn't do her duty. So it's an extract from an interview with the historian Anna Whitelock about the Tudor monarchs broadcast on a 2021 podcast called History Hit. Anna Whitelock is a historian who specialises in research in the British monarchy, especially the Tudors. And she says, Elizabeth I does not deserve her reputation. Her role and significance in things like the defeat of the Spanish Armada have been entirely overstated. There was instability across her reign as she did that about marriage candidates and about the execution of Mary Queen of Scots. By 1580, she was an old, childless, unmarried queen, which was not a position of strength. It was at this time that the people around her tried to put a positive spin on her position, calling her the Virgin Queen. 
making a virtue out of what was essentially a weakness. The main task of any monarch was to provide an heir, and Elizabeth didn't even try. Elizabeth seen as the poster girl of Tudor monarchy, but she ultimately failed. She allowed the throne to pass to the King of Scotland, and the Tudor monarchy died out with her. So we can see there two very, very different um, historical interpretations. And if we've done that highlighting, then it's going to help us um, to really um, understand the differences between the two interpretations. OK, so in terms of structure in this answer, paragraph one is all about how the interpretations dif differ, focusing on the overall impression and really focus on the extent to which they, they differ. So you're using phrases like they differ greatly. I try not to have um, too much on one interpretation and then too much on the other, but try and compare them all the way through. So using phrases like interpretation B suggests, whereas interpretation C suggests. Support with quotes, get quotes in your, from the interpretation to really back up your, your points as well. If you do really well on how they differ and the extent to which they differ, you can get up to like eight, nine marks for, for this. So that's it's really crucial to do well on that. So you're going to be looking to write like quite a bit for this answer. Um, you know, maybe sort of like eight, nine, ten lines for this. Paragraph two, explain why they differ. So yes, focus on provenance. So, you know, who wrote it, when and why. But really what they want you to be doing is focusing on the purpose and the audience. So the purpose is why has this been made, this interpretation? Why has the interpretation been made? And, you know, who's actually listening to it? Who's reading it? You know, who's actually um, the audience for this interpretation? So a few word banks there. So make sure you're using phrases like whereas or on the other hand. Um, but you really need to be getting into um, and drilling down into the extent to which these two interpretations differ and also focus on that overall impression you know what's the overall impression we get from each interpretation and what extent uh, to what extent does that differ okay so this is an example answer and you can see here that there is a very close comparison of these two interpretations we haven't got the first half of the paragraph on b and then the first second half of the paragraph on c we're we're linking them together using lots of connective language and that's really crucial to get a really good comparison of the two interpretations so let's have a look at this answer the overall impression is very different Interpretation B gives the view that Elizabeth was a very powerful and su successful monarch who controlled her subjects. The author sees Elizabeth's refusal to marry as a sign of great strength because it, quote, protected her power. On the other hand, the view of Interpretation C is extremely different. The overall view of Interpretation C is that Elizabeth was a weak and indecisive monarch whose reputation has been overstated and whose selfishness allowed the Tudor monarchy and dynasty to die out. The two interpretations are very different in how they describe Elizabeth. B states that she was decisive, whereas C states that she dithered. Both interpretations are similar in terms of how they both reflect on Elizabeth, Elizabeth's decision to, to not get married as a significant aspect of her rule. However, they disagree on whether this was a wise action with B being positive about this, whereas C is negative about this. Overall, B is a very positive portrayal regarding Elizabeth as a strong and powerful ruler, whereas C completely disagrees and believes that Elizabeth was not powerful and that she did not fulfil her duties as a monarch. Therefore, the two interpretations are extremely different. So that is um, a model paragraph on how to explain the differences between the two interpretations. Very close connective language, um, picking out details. Also being aware of, you know, maybe a little similarity between the interpretations as well. Um, but that's exactly what we are looking for for this answer. In terms of why the interpretations differ, you must focus on provenance, write about purpose and audience. So here would be an example here for you. The reason why the interpretations differ is because the article for Interpretation B was published on a feminist website whose purpose is to showcase powerful female role models to other women. Therefore, its audience may well be feminists who want to be inspired by powerful women. Therefore, the interpretation will emphasise Elizabeth's power and achievements and is unlikely to sympathise with the 16th century viewpoint that remaining single and childless was a failure. On the other hand, Interpretation C was written by a historian about the whole Tudor dynasty and may be placing Elizabeth's reign and her achievements in the context of other Tudor monarchs like Mary and Henry VIII. She clearly blames Elizabeth for the dynasty's end and her audience may well be much more general than the audience in Interpretation B. So that's a really, really good, very tightly focused answer on purpose and audience for you to consider. OK, so we're now going to go on to have a look at question eight and nine and how we would approach that for Elizabethans. Remembering, of course, that for the Elizabethans paper, the essay questions were 20 marks rather than the 18 marks you get for making America, People's Health and Germany. OK, so in terms of how to answer Elizabethans question eight and question nine, um, the mark scheme is there. So there are five different levels. 
Um, so one developed argument gets you into level two, five to eight, two developed arguments, level three, nine to 12, three developed arguments, but you must have a balanced argument is level four, 13 to 16, and then four developed arguments plus your clinching argument is level five. So steps, steps for success, uh, decode the question, be clear on what it's asking you to do. Make sure you keep linking back to the question in your answer. And for this question, we'll look at it in more detail. Um, you really need to get that quote of the historical interpretation in there. Make a quick plan. You need four well-explained paragraphs. That means you're using detailed and specific knowledge, analysis and explanation, and linking back to the question. And as a guide, you're looking for sort of eight, nine lines, maybe 10 lines for a paragraph. So it's a good, you know, weighty paragraph. Finish with a conclusion. We call that a clinching argument. The questions were 20 marks. So you want to spend about 25 minutes on it in the exam. So you had a choice of two questions for this exam. Question eight was according to the website elizabethy.org, Elizabeth I was remarkably tolerant. How far do you agree with this view of Elizabeth I's treatment of Catholics between 1580 and 1603? And then question nine was in his 2016 article, The Dark Side of Elizabethan England, historian James Sharp argues that life for the poor was dominated by violence, vagrancy and crushing hunger. How far do you agree with this view of daily life for the poor in Elizabethan society? So let's have a look at question eight. Um, so the, the key thing for this question, first of all, is to highlight the historical interpretation, which here is that Elizabeth was remarkably tolerant towards Catholics between 1580 and 1603. How far do you agree? It means you need to look at evidence to agree and disagree with the interpretation. And you must only focus on 1580 to 1603. Now, quite a few of you wrote quite a bit about the Elizabethan religious settlement and some of the ideas about her being quite lenient in the early part of her rule. And whilst that can be valid, you obviously need to link that into the fact that this was the situation at the start of Elizabeth's rule, or it gives you a little bit of um, you know, a clue, a bit of um, um, awareness of what Elizabeth's maybe true motivation was. So you just got to be careful in how you actually write about that within the exam. OK, so just a reminder for this question, you need to have your four uh, key paragraphs plus your clinching argument. And uh, within each paragraph, you need a developed argument and a reminder, developed arguments probably going to be sort of eight, nine, ten lines long. Specific and relevant knowledge, analysis using relevant SOC and historical language, SOC being second order concepts, and making a clear link back to the question. So you want to be quoting that historical interpretation within your answer. So you're going to be using phrases like this shows that Elizabeth I was remarkably tolerant because and that's going to really help unlock that analysis for you. So to be honest, there's lots of things you can write about for this question. You can agree with it and say she was relatively lenient in the 1580s and really bring in some of those the, the ideas about the middle way idea and the fact the settlement, the religious settlement of 1559, which was still, you know, there in 1580, um, had created that kind of structure for her religious views, her mostly remarkably tolerant. Uh, perhaps uh, you could talk about how she's relatively lenient towards people like Thomas Tresham, but then you could disagree and talk about some of the laws that she brought in, um, which challenged Catholics like the Act of Persuasions. You could talk about treatment of martyrs like Margaret Clitheroe. You could also bring in um, work and ideas about people like Mary Queen of Scots as well. OK, so here's a little summary, a little checklist for the question, which you can have a look at and then just some words to help you analyze. So you want to be using a phrase like this shows that this supports the view that this demonstrates. On the other hand, um, they're all really great analytical phrases to help you within your analysis. So this would be an example answer. Uh, we won't read through it all. And there's lots and lots of other things that you can bring in. There's a huge amount of evidence that you can bring into this answer. Um, and as I said before, you could also talk about how Elizabeth I was in some ways quite tolerant towards Mary Queen of Scots in that she kept her in prison for 19 years and was quite reluctant to execute her. But obviously we've got the evidence that she was subsequently executed in 1587 and some of the plots um, that she obviously had to deal with as well. So there's lots of evidence here for you to, to get. One of the things that I think came out in the, um, in the exam was that you need a little bit more knowledge about some of these different laws um, that happened um, in the 1580s. And, and they're very much the, the kind of messages that um, Elizabeth I does become uh, less tolerant of Catholics um, during this time period. Um, than she perhaps had been before, although there is plenty of evidence that she perhaps could have been even harsher. So that would be some of the key ideas for this question.
Here would be an example or conclusion that you could write. And again, just advice that some of that good historical language for a clinching argument can really help you develop your arguments in your main part of your essay as well. So you might say for a clinching argument, something like, overall, I disagree with the interpretation. The evidence of tolerance is mainly from right at the beginning of this period. By 1603, Elizabeth's tolerance had all but gone, with much tighter controls being introduced, and almost all of England's Catholics having given up their faith and attending Protestant church services. And there is a lot of evidence to suggest that Catholicism was very much on the wane um, by the end of Elizabeth's rule and therefore that might suggest that she hadn't been remarkably tolerant because if she had there probably would have been more Catholics left worshipping in England. OK, we're going to have a look at question nine. So the question nine focuses on daily lives. So the question is in his 2016 article, The Dark Side of Elizabethan England, historian James Sharp argues that life of the poor was dominated by violence, vagrancy and crushing hunger. How far do you agree with this view of daily life for the poor in Elizabethan society? So the historical interpretation here is life for the poor was dominated by violence, vagrancy and crushing hunger. So within your anal analysis, you really need to be using some of those key words. And when you're referring to those key words, put them in, um, in quotation marks so that you're really emphasising that you are addressing the historical interpretation. So it's not a simple question about was life for the poor good or bad. You've really got to evaluate that historical interpretation of violence, vagrancy and crushing hunger. Um, and, you know, even the fact that the book is called, the, the article is called The Dark Side of Elizabethan England suggests, you know, gives this sort of uh, portrayal that life was pretty difficult for, for poor people. You need to look at evidence to agree and disagree. So you need to focus on your learning from daily lives. But equally, um, I am going to sort of suggest to you as well that you can bring in some ideas about Elizabethan pastimes for this answer as well. And I'll explain why in just a moment. So you're going to make your quick plan. You're going to have your developed argument. And just remember, when you're linking back to the question, this shows that you want to be using phrases like this shows that Elizabethan life was violent or this shows that, you know, there was lots of vagrancy in Elizabethan England or, you know, vagrancy is obviously about begging or there was crushing hunger. So, you know, if you're talking about the uh, poor harvest between 1594 and 1597 and talk about the famines, you can talk about the idea of a crushing hunger during that time period. OK, so you're going to want to do a plan. And um, so if you might go for a couple of agrees, a couple of disagrees here. So you could talk about, yeah, you agree because there is an increase in the problem of poverty, in particular, the idea of crushing hunger during this time. So you could talk about the poor harvests and the subsequent famine and the food riots. Um, you could agree because there is an increase in the problem of vagrancy. So that will give you two developed arguments. You could disagree because you could talk about measures to help the poor, like the Elizabethan poor law or local support for the poor in places like York. And then you could also disagree because you could talk about how Elizabethan entertainments meant there was a much lighter side to Elizabethan society for poorer people. You could talk about how the fact that poor people could afford to go to the Elizabethan theatre, which they enjoyed, for example. So it wasn't all dominated by this. OK, so this would be an example answer that you could uh, write about, looking at how you could get those things in. Other things that you could talk about, you could talk about other Elizabethan pastimes being quite violent, for example, um, uh, to sort of bring in that idea of the violence. You could talk about um, the, the sense of um, there being sort of the executions, the death penalty for begging, for example, um, in sort of 1580s um, after the sort of Vagabonds Act of 1572. So there will be lots of evidence there for violence being a problem in Elizabethan society as well. So you can pause that and have a look at that example answer. These are the sort of things that you would want to be saying. And just remember to um, be using phrases which actually include the quote from the historian, particularly at the end of the answer. So you're linking back to the question clearly. OK, so here we have an example clinching argument. And just remember that top tip that using some of these ideas within your main essay will help you really develop your arguments. So an example clinching argument would be, Overall, I think the interpretation is too simplistic because it is not true of all poor people across the whole of this period for every single day. Also, although the new poor law did not solve the problem of poverty, it did keep a large number of the poor away from, quote, violence, vagrancy and crushing hunger. And you can see that the more that you can quote the historian's view um, within your answer, uh, the better it will be focused on the question. So that's a really good top tip to use within your answer. OK, so some key takeaways for question eight and nine. Decode the question carefully, four key arguments to a degree of balance and make clear links back to the question to make sure you're fully answering it and also support um, your work by quoting the view of the historian as well. OK, thanks for listening. Goodbye.